All right, I'm going to start this thing off. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's event is the Exposing the IRS event, which I hope you guys are excited about this. We have a social hour and one minute moment starting here in about two minutes. After that, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll pray to uh, our Father and Savior. And then I'm going to explain the federal tax code in my typical 10 10 minute portion. <laughs> I've got about 100 slides, so I hope you guys are ready for that. Then we're going to talk about the constitutionality of the income tax. And at 7.20, we have a new type of political entertainment. It's called, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Before Taxes? <laughs> I'm going to need three volunteers for that. And I'm going to give you a little hint. If you're paying attention to the federal tax code portion and the constitutionality portion, you might do just fine in that, uh, that part. Um, at 7.40, we are going to have a special guest from Rochester come here and explain to us what it's like to be targeted by the IRS while trying to file for a 501c3 status, tax-exempt status. So that's going to be real exciting. And then at 8.10, we're going to find out who Chris Ann Hall is and why you, should, you need to know who she is. And at 8.20, we're going to watch what's hot on YouTube. And I got a really good compilation this month for you guys. All right. I see a lot of food at tables but I do see some empty tables. The uh, Machine Shed's got a buffet here for us, $10, it's an Italian style buffet. And Benner, was it, is it pretty good? It was awesome. Okay, it was awesome. Benner says it's awesome, $10, and they've got a full bar menu, so please give them some business. Jack Rogers, explain to these fine people who the tea party is. Me? That's, that's part of the agenda here. <laughs> How are y'all doing anyway? It's too quiet for a tea party, right? Isn't it a little too quiet for a tea party? I met all of you. You're so polite to me. You obviously don't know I don't wear a shirt and tie normally. Just might come here to serve all of you. Anyway, anyway, the tea party. Wow. This is, Jake, is this our third meeting here? Third meeting. Can I have all of the people from the 56 Club stand up for a minute. Give them a hand over here, too. I need to tell you something real quick, Jake, and I won't, I won't drag it out, but the 56 Club is one of the groups that helped me get involved in the Tea Party because they asked me to come down to Hastings and read the Constitution with them. And I did that, I think we did that three years in a row. Two years in a row, three years in a row. But anyway, last year when they went to do it, the city wouldn't allow it. Imagine that. Anyway, they're wonderful people. They welcomed me down there. But the tea party is about you. It is. People sitting around you are like-minded people that want three things. What are those three things? Because this will be, you'll be tested on each time I come back. Limited. What kind of Limited. <laughs> Let's go with constitutionally limited government, which means protecting your liberty, right? What's, what's, uh, there it is right there, individual liberties, okay? What's the other one? Don't trip the slide, don't give them the hints here. What's the, no, what? Free markets, what's that mean? We can do business without the government standing on our backs, correct? And what's the most important one that goes down to the roots of each family? See, you all know this. Now, if you all know this, why doesn't our government know this? Isn't this easy? What? That's right. That's right. They're in it. They run for office for the funds of it. <laughs> Uh, I tell you, I get to sleep more. Anyway, those three things are very important. And as we move through the evening here, uh, we may even talk about candidates and some challenges and different things. But if you want to know who a candidate is that you should support, hold up those three core values, okay? Jake, is that good? That's good, Jack. See, when you... We, we could not have done that in a worse order. <laughs> 
If you use Twitter, which means you're a tweeter, or Twitter, I always get it wrong. Hashtag East Metro Tea Party. Let the people know what we're doing here tonight. All right, each month what we do is a special section called One Minute Moments, and we adopted this thing from the North Metro Tea Party Patriots, the organization that Jack leads. One Minute Moments is a time for you to tell us that you're running for office. Is Tom Emmer in the parking lot? No, just kidding. Promote a separate Tea Party event, explain your Tea Party friendly business, tell us about your political organization, vent your frustrations about the growth of government, anything to deal with the Tea Party, that's what we do. Now, one minute moment means how long is it gonna be? One minute, one minute. very good. So, so, let me, so let me give you an example, I'll lead it off here. I'm Jake Duesenberg, I own an investment advising firm, J. Duesenberg Financial. In the last month, I've spent a lot of time building the Tea Party organization, so I don't market much. If you have a 401k that needs to be rolled over, come see me after this. That's an example of one minute moment. Okay, there are some exceptions to the one minute moments. I have granted some people the power to take two to three minutes. One of those people is Jim Grinnells, so we'll start it off with Jim here. And by the way, if you want to speak, just stand over here at the table, and then I will bring you up here one at a time. Thank you very much. Uh, I view this as simply a public service kind of announcement. I think it's good news, and it's news that you can kind of use. Um, but it starts from a good court decision that occurred last year. Some of you may have heard about it, um, but I'm going to present it as the problem and then the court solution and then suggest how you might make use of it. Uh, in Duluth, there is an event called, uh, well, it's sort of like Razzle Dazzle Days, or I'm blocking on it, but they, they, rent, um, they rent the park. And it's uh, an event with um, kind of in the Christmas or New Year's season. And some people came to the event, and uh, it's it just a typical park event with um, some people came and handed, wanted to hand out brochures, and they were told they could not do so. So this eventually ended up in court, and um, to the good news is the court ruled that you do have the right to hand out religious, political brochures at a park even if it has been rented by a private organization. Now, the city of Duluth and um, the organization that was having their event then thought they could get around, around it by renting the whole park. Uh, the court came back and was quite angry about that and said, no, if a public arena is a site where <clears throat> free speech uh, other First Amendment type activities can normally take place, then it continues to be a venue for that kind of behavior afterwards. Now, I don't know if anybody else here has um, attempted to hand out brochures. I did at one point rent a booth at an, uh, a local organization, asked if I could give a speech in back of my booth. This was actually a Ron Paul booth. And they said, no, we don't want a speech. Politics is not fun. Our event is fun. So. I rented uh, another uh, venue and had some nice cards made up and started to hand them out at the uh, event and they said, no, you could not. And I ceased handing them out. I wasn't uh, wanting to get arrested or any such thing. But I'm very pleased to now know that you can do this. Um, so. What I'm encouraging you to do, if you are a member of any organization and you have the desire to make use of your First Amendment rights, particularly if you're in a religious organization, you could go to some event such as, I think, the Taste of Minnesota. I had a friend who went to the Taste of Minnesota that used to be held on the Capitol steps, and he was told he couldn't hand anything out because it was private property. Um, so I, <laughs> I recommend that you... Uh, Go with a brochure and you will hit all four uh, um, rights at one time. Um, the right to assemble, because all the people are there. Hand out your brochure, I consider that part of the freedom of the press. You'll be speaking to people, that's freedom of speech, and it'll be a on a religious topic, and that's freedom of religion, so. Yes? Yes, um, the only 
caveat that I might have on that is yeah, I think it has to be, I, I'm not sure if they charge an admission if it changes, but I know if there's no admission charge, which many of these do not have. Uh, this article, you can Google it by going to, where I found it is on WorldNet Daily. If you Google um, Duluth uh, free speech, you'll find it. I, I've taken down the court case and, and have that. I spoke to the attorneys who represented the case. Um, I plan to hand out some brochures that first, the first brochures are going to highlight this very fact. You know, that'll kind of, I think, should make a point. They've said that if the police uh, say you can't do it, then I will give in, um, hopefully have it videotaped, and hopefully make a million dollars in a lawsuit, and I'll retire and never. <laughs> um, but the point is not to get arrested. The point is to, to make use of, of a free speech opportunity. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All righty. Hey, we already got a tweeter in here. <laughs> Next up, say your name and what you got going on. My name is Leslie. I belong to the 56 Club. We go to North Metro Tea Party and now we're coming here as well. You may like my button. It says, I support the 10th Amendment. If you don't know what the 10th Amendment is, it's really easy to look up in this little book that you should carry with you everywhere. If you want a 10th Amendment button, come see me when this event ends. There's one caveat. When you ask for a button, you have to tell me what the 10th Amendment says. You don't have to quote it. You just have to know what it says. It's only one sentence long. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. All right, who's next? Say your name and why you're here tonight. Sounds good. Hello all, my name is Stephanie Michaelis. I am also a 56 Club member. I've had a calling here in the last few weeks or so. We all know, or I suppose a lot of us know what's going on with the Common Core curriculum. I have a 17 year old daughter. I've been going through the public school systems and charter school systems and know what's out there. And I want to, I left flyers on your tables, but I want to breach out into a private tutoring that will be on godly principles and uh, the principles of uh, liberty in this country. So if you know kids, grandkids, anyone that may benefit from the service, I'm home based out of Bloomington, but I will travel. And um, if you need more information, give me a call. Thanks. Thank you very much. That, that can't be it. I know there's more people that want to talk. Anyone else? One minute moments. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? You looking for Joe? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anyone else, show me your hand if you want to talk right now. One minute moments. This is really unusual. We usually have uh, everybody and their brother wanting to talk. All right, well, we'll just continue on with social hour, and at 7 o'clock, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. You can come find me if you... Uh-oh. I just can't resist. All right. I guess the next 10 minutes are taken care of now. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like an addiction. It's like an addiction. My name is Bob Tatro. I'm a political activist, and uh, along with my wonderful colleague, Mr. Stephen Ellenwood, we are attempting to stop light rail in this state, and the gateway... <laughs> Thank you. And I just wanted to say that we're doing all we can to do that, and I just uh, hope that any of you who want to or hear about anything going on with uh, programs will participate in it. Yes, Betty. Well, it's going to run from uh, the uh, that new uh, 250 million quarter of a billion dollar depot they have down there, which is I don't know who's in it, but it's make a nice homeless shelter I think for the winter. But uh, anyhow, it's going to run right up there. It's going to go across mounds. It's going to go down Hudson Boulevard. It's going to destroy every business and home on Hudson Road, and uh, they don't care. And it's going to jump over 61. It's going to jump over a couple of freeways. It's going to be atrocious. I mean, it's just, if you all remember the Rondo destruction, it's going to be worse than that. I mean, it's just terrible. So if you hear anything about it, if you hear about programs that like uh, Mr. Ellenwood and I are putting on to try and stop it, please participate. And I. I yield my minute. What? 
it's going in, well, it probably will. I mean, it's going, I don't know how they're going to fill in Lake Tanner to get it to go next to that. I mean, it's just a horrible thing. Are you, are you yielding the rest of your minute to me? Yeah. You got, you got a question or you want to speak? Okay, come on up. See, I knew there'd be more people. Say your name. Hi, everybody. My name is Bob Burke. I, I, this is the first time I've come to your meeting. I didn't want to be one of the guys who jumped up in the first two or three people, but there were only two or three people. That's okay. You're right. I can't believe we don't have anything to say. Uh, I come from Hudson, and I'm the chair of the Libertarian Party, Pearson St. Croix. I have a couple of individuals from my party. We had a meeting to talk about our upcoming uh, 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 plans for the county fairs. Um, I think this is an interesting event. I'm excited to talk about what the IRS has been doing, but I want to ask a few people in the room, does anybody here have a line in the sand? We all have these problems with this, but in Wisconsin, our Tea Party had Ron Johnson standing, pounding, yelling, and he voted for the $62 billion tax increase that the president laid out. Our congressman voted for CISPA. Facebook, YouTube, Google can now give all of your information Give all of your information to the government without a warrant. And the law doesn't give you the right to sue them for doing it. What's your line in the sand? That's the big question I have for the Tea Party. It's my first Tea Party event. And I want to hear. I don't want this to be a red team event. Is this, are we here for our freedom and are we here for our liberty? That's what I'd like to hear tonight and I hope I do, Jake. And I wish you guys the best. I think it's an important thing to talk about the IRS because it needs to be abolished. Thank you very much. Okay, Joey, you want to speak? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk. You know, you're beating down the IRS. I'm good. Oh well, yeah, join the team. <laughs> um, one of the companies that I have a little money into is called Jungle Smokes, and we're a cigar company. It's all women in Honduras who roll cigars for me, and I. People don't realize how much we pay in taxes. I pay 52.75% to the federal government on my retail sales before I've sold any cigars. So for me to get my cigars into the country, I have to pay the IRS and they just sent me a $14,822 bill plus a $1,000 fine yesterday because they have reclassified my cigars. So anyway, I mean, when it comes to government intrusion, it's unbelievable. And Governor Dayton has also signed uh, uh, the smoking whatever. I don't even, I haven't even looked at the paperwork yet, but I'm probably paying another 35%. So the cost of my cigars is double and I can't even make, I mean, I, I have to decide whether I'm gonna shut down the company or not. I haven't owned it very long, but um, the cost of the cigars is double because of the taxes that I have to pay. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in here who aren't big fans of smoking and whatever. Well, this is a free country and you should be able to smoke and you should be able to do whatever you want to yourself in a free country. So that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Anyway, junglesmokes.com if you want cigars. I might as well throw that out there. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> because I have a tax lien that I'm going to have to pay, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm coming up with that money right now. Well, hey, we believe in free enterprise in this room, so please plug your business. We want to give business to people of like mind. Anyone else out there here that wants to talk? Anyone else? All right, it's still casual, so uh, for the next... 12 minutes, talk amongst yourselves. If you haven't signed in, that's the easiest way for me to get a hold of you. And honest to God, if you're Republican, if you're a Libertarian, I don't care. If you believe in free markets, you believe in fiscal responsibility, and you believe in liberty, which means a constitutional limited government, I want to reach you all the time. I want to talk to you about what's going on in the Tea Party movement. So uh, is, who's got the, uh, who's got the sign-in sheet right now? I know it's going around in a, a binder. Is that it? No, no. Well, I'll find it and I'll make sure it goes around here. So we'll get started in about 12 minutes. Shirt on, come up. We'll do. We'll have you lead the pledge of allegiance here. <laughs> you know it, right? <laughs> Please stand, everybody. Yeah. 
I pledge allegiance to the United, to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hold on one second. Name? Ev Acker. Ev Acker, and what service? Uh, Army. Army? How many years did you serve? Two. What years were those? Uh, six, uh, 65 to 67. Okay, thank you very much for your service. Round of applause for... <laughs> Uh, remain standing here. Can you stand, please, for the uh, prayer? By the way, look around. Every time I get in one of these meetings, I look around and I look at the miracles on your left and your right and in front of you and behind you. It's something else. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you in so many ways for letting us gather here. We thank you for the opportunity that you are presenting to us to preserve the liberties that you do want us to have. We ask that you guide us, fill us with discernment and wisdom. Be with this meeting tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Jack. All right. Every month we start the East Metro Tea Party with an update on the national debt. Now, I always have that honor of explaining economics and uh, if you haven't been paying attention, that's not a fun subject nowadays. I have a stress ball. You show me your hand, I will send you the stress ball. And, and uh, it, it might come in handy when we start talking about the federal income tax. So uh, where we're standing at right now, uh, total public debt, according to the Treasury Department's uh, daily amount that they show, is actually 16.7. We're actually kind of paying down and staying stagnant right now in debt. It's pretty surprising. I still believe our budget deficit this year is going to be about a trillion dollars, but right now the projections look like it could be as low as $650 billion. Oh, I, no. I, yeah, only, only that, right? I keep it at a trillion because we are uh, four years straight of trillion dollar plus deficits, and uh, until I see it different, the projection in my head is still going to be that trillion dollars, but the, the federal uh, the federal government has taken in actually more revenue than they were expecting. And then we also have a monetary base, which means all the cash that's flowing around the system right now, $3.1 trillion. And to give you just a little frame reference, uh, about six years ago was a third of that. Okay. Hope you guys are ready for this. My next 200 slides, I'm going to go through the whole federal income tax code. <laughs> Stress ball? I'm just kidding. I'm just going to run through here. Uh, some of the stuff you'll know, some of this you might not know. Don't want to insult anyone's intelligence. And I know there's some smarter tax guys in here uh, other than me because I see a couple CPAs, so hopefully my info is correct. We're going to talk about how the federal income tax works. This is what we have right now. It's called the progressive income tax. It means if you work harder, you make more money, you get taxed at a higher percentage. And we call those marginal tax rates here on the left side. And those apply to a certain tax bracket. Now, there are, I think, four different uh, types or categories that IRS is concerned with. I just showed the two here that are probably most common. You have your single filers and you have your married filers who, join, uh, who file jointly to the IRS. Okay, so this is info that you provide to the IRS. So as you can see, the, the uh, people not making much income, and this is, by the way, uh, your adjusted gross income, which means before you deduct or take credits, uh, th this is what it, you would pay 10% if you were in that lower bracket. Now, on the bottom here is the new wealthy class, according to President Obama, and a bunch of those rhinos there in the U.S. House and Senate, the Republicans that don't really believe in uh, limited government, that voted for this uh, so-called tax uh, plan that saved us from the fiscal cliff. You guys remember this back in January? So they, this is what a bunch of Republicans and Democrats voted for. We're going to tax the single filers of 400000 and up and 450000 for the married joint filing. That's the new rich. And we're going to jack those those rates up to 39.6%. So if you make that much money, that is your uh, bracket. Now, a lot of people I run into don't I realize this, but if you make $400,000 as a single person, do you know what your tax, or how much you pay in percent in tax? 
It's not really 39.6. It actually, your first 8,950 is at 10%, then this amount goes to 15%. That's how the tax system works. So generally speaking, just because you make 400,000 doesn't mean your whole income is according to that. And remember also, uh, this is adjusted gross income, so this is uh, not really what you make because any smart person is going to deduct uh, certain expenses, uh, home mortgage, business expenses, or they're going to take credits. Well, I, I'm going to. Now, my CPAs, am, am I good so far here? <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the history of the nation's income tax, because you know what? We didn't always have an income tax, and our libertarian friend here, I agree with them. I think the IRS needs to be abolished. I don't think we should follow the 16th Amendment, quite frankly, but we have a current system that started really under Abraham Lincoln to pay for the Civil War. And at that point, uh, if you were making under $10,000, you were only paying 3%, and if you were paying anything above that, it's 5%. Now, that's small, right? Generally speaking, the Civil War, at least the Union side, was financed through inflation. The greenback was deflated quite significantly in that period of time. But this is the start of the income tax era, right? Now, after the Civil War, we got rid of the income tax. We tried it again in the 1890s, but we didn't really start it without a break until a little thing called the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution passed and was ratified in the year 1913. Are you going to talk about that, Dave? Where'd Benner go? Oh, he's out of the room. Okay. 1913 is when the, the 16th Amendment was ratified. So starting in 1913, when the IRS really got its uh, legs, we had a 7% top tax rate, right? Remember that margin, marginal tax rate? So the people at the top income level were paying 7%. Let's go through the chronolog chronology here. To pay for the World War I, we jacked that all the way up to 77% as the highest tax rate. In the Roaring Twenties, we got down to 25% on the top rate, and then jacked it right back up into the Great Depression, and under FDR, we were up in the 94% for a federal income tax on the high side. All right, in the 60s and 70s, we were in the 70 percentile range, and we started the 80s at 50 percent, and anyone remember that Ronald Reagan guy? Bringing it down to a top rate of 28 percent. Of course, the progressive era of the Clinton administration brought those rates right back on up to 39.6 percent for the top filers. And under President Bush, uh, his tax plan in 2001 and 2003, we brought that down to 35 percent, of course, that was the law until recently when uh, we were trying to avoid the fiscal cliff, and we jacked that back up to 39.6. Stress ball? It's actually not bad, historically speaking. It's funny how not a lot of people pay that income tax when it's 94%. That's France. Okay. I talked about individuals, individual filers. The important thing to understand is, and why we're here tonight, is to talk about if you're not an individual, how do you file taxes if you have income? Well, if that income is derived through business interaction, so it's producing profit, we have basically two different types of entities, uh, for lack of uh, you know, saving some time here. You have uh, people that pass, or an entity that passes its income through to the investors or to the owners. And those are things like sole proprietorships, partnerships, LLCs, S-Corps. And so that, that ends up getting filed as an individual tax uh, to the uh, IRS paid by that taxpayer. So like those slides before. Now the mass majority of businesses in the United States file their taxes this way. And I can't stress that enough. Most small businesses are going to file their taxes this way, and therefore when they tax or they lift the, the rates on the uh, income tax brackets, it's really affecting that group. The next category <clears throat> is corp are corporations, and we, we do something called the double tax. A corporation pays a direct corporate income tax to the federal government, to the IRS, but they also sometimes take their income and they pass it on to shareholders via dividend payments. Those dividends are reportable to the IRS through uh, income tax directly from those taxpayers. So that's where you get that term double taxation. Any questions? Pretty self-explanatory here. I don't think a lot of people probably learn anything from this slide. But the point in bringing this up is there's a difference when you're not in the business for tax for, for making profit. You're in the business because you're in social welfare or charity. And so the IRS has recognized that. 
they have something called nonprofit or tax exempt organizations. So your typical donor gives money that's already been taxed, likely, and they give it to the nonprofit organization, in this case, the Tea Party organization. And then, the, and then apparently we can give that money, it doesn't go through taxation, and it goes to charity or social welfare. In our case, more likely social welfare. <clears throat> so here's what happens. A nonprofit has to talk to the IRS and they have to ask for a 501c status uh, that says they're tax exempt. We're gonna cover on the left side, uh, the C3 and the right side, C4. C3 means we want the people giving our money to our organization to be able to deduct that from their income taxes. So it actually benefits the donor as well. If they give $1,000, they can report it to the IRS on their personal filing as a deduction that they gave $1,000 to a C3 organization. And I believe, Cindy, that's what, what you're gonna be talking about tonight. On the right side, C4s operate a little differently. Those donors can't deduct that from taxes, but in order for the, the, prof, the nonprofit organization to still be tax exempt, they have to communicate with the IRS and let them know that. And C4s have a little bit more cush room as far as getting involved with uh, politics, as long as that's under 50% of the things that they do. Okay, that's as much as I'm gonna talk about tonight. I was joking about those 200 slides. This is just where we're at, and a little brief history on the income tax. We're gonna learn about how that was applied as a targeting tactic by the left. Now let's learn about what the founders thought of an income tax and the constitutionality. Here's Dave Bed, oh wait, I forgot about this slide. My Twitter handle, and if you need more info on this topic, you can go to my website. Okay, let's hear about the constitu constitutionality from David Benner. Howdy. All right, so in the 18th century, there was once a printer, and this printer migrated at a very young age from Boston to Philadelphia. He was a self-made, self-educated man. Um, he, he was an innovator, a statesman, and a philosopher. Perhaps his greatest accomplishment and what gave him the most fame was he published a popular almanac under the pseudonym of Richard Saunders. And, uh, I'm going to read just a short word of wisdom that he provided in Poor Richard's Almanac from 1758. It would be a hard government that should tax its people one-tenth part of their income. So here we are sitting, talking about the IRS and talking about the income tax brackets. And back then, the founders had some solutions. I mean, that was a hardship. I, we, uh, a young lady earlier mentioned that she spends 52.75% uh, of her income in federal taxes. So I usually say that quotes mean really nothing unless you get the entire context behind them. So I'd like to try to demonstrate that context today and try to demonstrate why um, number one, that that type of taxation, a productivity tax, would have potentially be seen as something egregious, and also that uh, the income tax itself was rarely discussed because of how unfathomable it seemed to the founders at the conception of our early republic. So because of that, I just wanted to show you Poor Richard's Almanac. This is just a demonstration. Almanacs were popular forms of consumable media in the 18th century especially that had, you know, tidbits, uh, wise pieces of wisdom, puzzles, various other amusements, sometimes even seasonal weather forecasts and things like that. So that's what I read from. So. It also, the reason why the British experience is so premised in being opposed to an income tax goes all the way back to the 13th century in the signing of the Magna Carta. But leading up to that were several key events that caused the barons to force King John's hand by the sword to sign this impo uh, important document. And that was because King John wanted to establish a system in which uh, productivity was taxed to pay for various exploits that he had proposed. One was the Fourth Crusade. Another was his repeated invasions of Normandy and the attempt to establish a French dynasty. So he did this by creating um, what I believe the founders thought was an antiquated and draconian system of taxation known as the income tax. It, it served as really the first time where the king, without any kind of uh, parliamentary consent, brought it to the people and made them pay. 
So this action along with the, uh, John's ability to intercede in the church and uh, appoint the Archduke of Canterbury against the will of the people led to an excommunication by Pope Innocent III and the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215. Also a small civil war known as the First Baron Wars later. Um, the Magna Carta itself uh, condemns direct taxation in many different clauses. You can read it today. There's about a dozen clauses that condemn an income tax in the Magna Carta of 1215. I just wanted to read one because I think it kind of summates that notion in the best form. This is clause 12 of the Magna Carta. No skewage or aid may be levied in our kingdom without its general consent, unless it is for the ransom of our person to make our eldest son a knight and to once marry our eldest daughter. Skewage in this case means uh, a, a service-based tax for people to avoid military service. Aid refers to the income tax. But that's just an example. You can read the Magna Carta to get a better scope of why people were enraged about the income taxes. The other thing is this was based upon the notion that consumption taxes or indirect taxes were more ethically suitable than a direct income tax. Um, 700 years of British experience had influenced the Founding Fathers to feel the way that they did about taxation. In the early parts of our republic, we just had import duties. So once the import duties uh, seemed to be as high as Alexander Hamilton wanted them to be, he started to propose excise taxes. And the first major excise tax was the whiskey excise tax. Now that was a pretty controversial measure in its own right, but just wanted to kind of formulate the uh, mind frame that, you know, we were going by consumption-based, indirect taxes at the time. Um, Alexander Hamilton said during the, in the Federalist Papers in Federalist 84 that it has been several times truly remarked that Bill of Rights are, in their origin, stipulations between kings and their subjects, abridgments of prerogative in favor of privilege, reservations of rights not surrendered to the prince. Such was Magna Carta obtained by the barons, sword in hand, from King John. So Alexander Hamilton was relating the British experience of the Magna Carta in the inclusion of our own documents. In fact, Alexander Hamilton opposed an inclusion of the Bill of Rights because he argued that the living constitution of Britain was already part of our constitution, our rights and our liberties. So, um, I wanted to display Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution up here just to kind of infer its relation to the Magna Carta and to the clause that I specified earlier, where the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. So I wanted to remark two things about this, one of the most important parts of um, the congressional powers that are enumerated in the Constitution. The first is that it only acknowledges a world in which indirect taxes are in existence. Duties, imposts, and excises have nothing to do with income, and that kind of scenario would have seemed somewhat unfathomable. Uh, the second thing is that no other body than Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes. Now, that's what I want to kind of relate to the IRS a little bit later. But first, I want to talk about the potential for a combination between income taxes and consumption taxes. I trace a lot of my political philosophy to Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson discussed this in the 1816 letter to a friend. The combination, remember, the, the system in which we live today. This is what Jefferson had to say about that. For example, if the system be established on basis of income and its just proportion on that scale has already been drawn from everyone, to step into the field of consumption and tax special articles in that as broadcloth or homespun, wine or whiskey, a coach or wagon purchased, having already paid its tax as income, to pay another tax on the thing it purchased is paying twice for the same thing. It is an aggrievance on the citizens who use these articles in exoneration of those who do do not, contrary to the most sacred duties of government, to do equal and impartial justice to all its citizens. So even back then, Thomas Jefferson was already envisioning a scenario in which people were taxed multiple times with the same amount of productive aggregate. That would have been considered uh, callous and villainous. Um, 
so as it is, we now have the IRS that was instituted in 1913. So more or less for about 150, 150 years or so, our government sustained itself just on excise taxes and import duties. There are a few uh, times where the federal government tried to exert the ability to create an income tax. Jake mentioned um, that briefly earlier, the Revenue Act of 1861 and 1862 under Lincoln what served as a temporary income tax, but largely for 150 years we sustained ourselves. Then upon the passage of the 16th Amendment, which by the way, there are some controversial aspects of how that was passed. I don't want to delve into that, but that was passed in 1913 under the Progressive Era when government argued that it need, needed a larger sum of the people's aggregate to promote the general welfare of the people, right? And the last time I spoke to this group, we talked about uh, James Madison's views on what the general welfare was. But the one thing I wanted to talk about uh, that I mentioned earlier is that only the Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes. That was never removed as part of the 16th Amendment or any other amendment. Um, this is an extremely important point because the IRS serves as a semi-autonomous entity that's wholly disconnected to the populace. We really have no recourse like we do for congressional leaders if we don't like what they are doing. We don't have an IRS representative that we write to and hope that they change their ways. Uh, it's subject to less course in the form of elections. And as was brought about earlier in many people's discussions, it's a very intrusive entity. I don't necessarily want the feds to know how I derive most of my income, right? Um, as we've learned about in the last few weeks, it targets political opponents despite them being accountable to the people, supposedly. That's why we created the IRS, right? But uh, as we've seen, it hasn't been a great experience for the Tea Party, and Cindy Mays will talk about that later. Um, because of all these things I mentioned, the founders today, I think, would consider our current form of income and in combination with the duties we pay on excises, sales taxes, property taxes, all sorts of direct taxes in addition to consumption taxes, I think that it would be viewed as somewhat egregious, callous, villainous, and unethical. Um, another word of wisdom that Benjamin Franklin once, once uh, wrote in Poor Richard's Almanac is, um, there are but two certainties in life, death and taxes, and that's a famous one, right? But that does not mean that we should be led under duress to supporting what we think is the most egregious tax, and that is the income tax. So thank you guys for listening, and I'm really interested to hear what the rest of the speakers say tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Benner. And if you want to follow Benner on Twitter, it's at Crush It Sun. It goes with his personality. And, and he's always available for some extra income, or, or I mean, some extra constitutional or founding fathers talk uh, over beer afterwards at the after party. So uh, please stick around if you want to talk to him some more. Okay, next up, Jack, come on out of here. Jack, explain to these good people what we were able to accomplish in the next or last week. Well, we got the leaves and grass straightened out over at Jake's house finally. <laughs> you know that's not the truth. Well, you know we were working really hard on what? What were we all trying to accomplish? Put together a what? Traveling toolkit. toolkit. Y'all did it. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> there it is. Started as an idea late at night. How can we make a difference? Well, the only way we know to make a difference is to involve all the people that want to make a difference. Well, some people want to make a difference, and so we needed the tools. So if we had tools, hammer, saw, screwdrivers, nails, that type of thing, they're no good if they lay there, are they? Can't build a house with that. Well, we've taken the first step. And it took um, a lot of uncomfortable time, okay? Have you ever had to go and ask somebody for something? Okay? Yeah. Well, that's what Jake and I were doing. That's what some of the other of the coordinators were doing to help this happen, to make this happen. And so guess what I'm going to do again? See this, even though it says North Metro, we run on a tight budget. We use our same jug all the time. I'm going to start this around. Throw in your hundreds, your five hundreds, they're perfectly okay. 
We'll just say it was miscellaneous cash. But I want you to look at this picture real carefully. Uh, you're looking at the projector. Y'all help do that, okay? That can go to another place to help a brand new tea party start the first tea party. Kirk, who's sitting over there in the white shirt, he's one of the other coordinators. The f he's got the flags, he's got the sound system coming. He just found somebody that may uh, give us the podium. Jake got a screen, Kirk also found mics. It's coming together. But the most important part of this I want to show you is this. What's that? Somebody help me here. It's the hitch. And you see this tool is not of any use if it stays parked in a driveway. The real, no, I don't want a truck. I, we, we, geez. What I want, yeah, yeah, what it has to do is the next step is forced to pull it. And let me explain that to you. Let's say we have five different districts that really want something to happen right away, okay? Well, for sure there's three of us that can travel. So we may need a volunteer. Uh, let's say I ask you to bring your Chevy pickup over and hook up and go up and go through the presentation because in, in, with this, we have a smart manual that a person can take and just go through it and they can run a tea party, okay? But you have to drive up there, cost you gas, right? You may have to stay overnight. That's the pulling part and that's why I'm passing that jug around. We have just begun the fight and this is gonna be a difference and if we can put this on the road and if we can plant five tea parties, before the next election that are effective like this one is, you all are winners. Do you see it happening? Where's the, the guy that said, where do you draw the line? We're drawing the line. We're taking the fight to them. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jack. <clears throat> I, I hate asking for money uh, in politics, but it, it is a reality. But you know, more importantly, uh, a warm body is actually more important than the cash. And so if you don't have uh, money to give away politically, don't do it. Uh, you know, you got other things. But if you can give us some time, come see me afterwards. Uh, the East Metro Tea Party needs some help getting organized right now. It's really falling on Dave and my plate. So I could use some help here and then some other big things that we got planned uh, around the state. We could use some volunteers. So if you can volunteer some time, please come see me afterwards. I'd love to have it. And more importantly, if you got an idea for a new tea party, I'm not offended. There's no geographical borders. If you want to start one right over in Woodbury across the Highway 94, that's another tea party. That's progress. That's another news story. Come see us afterwards. Uh, we would like to help you out with that. That's what that toolkit's for. And by the way, the money that we have raised has also allowed us the ability to not have to charge for the Chris Ann Hall event at the Mermaid on Saturday. And Jackson can tell you more about that later. You have a question? Anything I could use, I could use someone that's good with technology, someone that's good at data input. I could use someone that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the the fancy stuff, you know, the display, needless to say. You know, I don't know what, what other term to use, feng shui. <laughs> so uh, all that kind of stuff. If you think you've got a skill that we could use, I'd love to see it. Okay, this is why everyone likes to come to the East Metro Tea Party. I got one more question, go ahead. Yep. Great question. I mean, I think uh, we kind of take it for granted. People have been built up to it at this point. The to yep, the toolkit is designed to help build new Tea Party organizations. I just started this East Metro two months ago, and I was, you know, figuring out how, how am I going to find something like, uh, you know, a sound system. Well, luckily, I know someone with a sound system. I don't have a flag. We didn't even have a Gadsden flag at our first organization. I luckily have a projector for my business, but some people don't have that. So we have it all ready to go and a smart book, as we called it in the military. I'm an Army veteran. Um, like just uh, everything you need to know about starting a tea party, and we can take it to any location. Any, all we need is someone that stands up to plate and says, I want to start a tea party, and we'll say, guess what? We got a trailer here. We got everything you need for that, that part that party to hold that event and uh, we'll show you how to do it how to get in the media how to run a successful meeting so good question okay now everyone comes to East Metro Tea Party and this is what makes us different well, that's what makes us better than the North Metro is we do something called the political entertainment hour <laughs> so 
We usually do with the Price is Right 1913 edition, but this month we have Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Before Taxes? <laughs> so I need three volunteers to come on up here. Show hands. Give me a hand, somebody. Well, that's not right. Go ahead. Kathy, come on. I need two more volunteers. Guys, there are prizes here. We have sponsorship. Libertarian Party guy. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, we, we're not cheap. We got prizes here. I, got, I need one more volunteer to come on down and play. Who wants to be a millionaire before taxes? Linda, you're going to come up here? Come on up here, Linda. All right. Very good. Thank you. We'll have you guys stand right here so we get you on camera here. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll have you stand right here, and that should do just fine. Okay, um, so let me, let me go through the rules here, because we're usually playing a different game. The rules of the game is you have one minute to answer each question by yourself, but we're going to start out with one question, and the first person to raise their hand is our contestant. The other two walk away with a $5 gift card to Caribou Coffee. Can't complain with that. So if you raise your hand and you know the answer, all right, then you're going to move on. That person has three methods of assistance. We've all seen the show. I, I've watched it a couple times. You, can, you got 50-50. I'll remove two of the an possible answers. We'll allow you to call a friend. You literally can call a friend on the phone. You got one minute, though. And we'll ask for audience participation. And since we're not as well funded to have those little clicker things, we're going to ask you guys to just shout out the answer like the price is right. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to start out. After this first round, each one of you will have a $5 caribou card, all right? Now, if you lost this first question, you go back to your seats, you got a $5 caribou card. The person that won that question moves on, but that's not necessarily yours, because you could lose it. You have to answer the first three questions until that $5 gift card is safe. After that point, you have the ability to win another $5 caribou card, and that's what you have at stake. You have to answer the next three questions. And the million dollar prize, and I, I've heard that the sponsor can't afford the million dollar prize. So uh, the million dollar prize will be a $10 gift card to Subway plus those two $5 caribou cards. <laughs> the, we're driving home a point here. I'll, I'll let you see it. <laughs> OK, that's right. Well, the money just grows on trees, right? All right, this month's sponsor. Well, imagine that, Jay Duesenberg Financial. <laughs> Let your investment portfolio follow your political beliefs. If you left a 401k behind, let me uh, come talk to me. I've got, uh, I'll be over here at the end of the meeting and we can talk. We had, uh, I, just, just because cu uh, Countertops Direct isn't sponsoring this month, uh, they were actually helping out with the, the event on Saturday. So uh, last month's sponsor was Countertops Direct and they're a good organization. So if you need a new countertop, I still would like you to go help out uh, the guys at Countertop Direct. Okay. Any questions on the uh, game? First question, you all get a stab at first hand, and they're going to keep it honest. Ready? You ready? No. All right. Who did Michelle Bachman run against in the 2006 Congressional District 6 general election? Was it A, Terrell Clark, B, Patty Wetterling, C, Jim Graves, or D, Marcus Bachman? Clark. Linda. Linda. Patty Wetterling. Patty Wetterling. Linda is our contestant. All right. Thanks for participating. Here's your $5 gift card to Caribou Coffee. Don't leave without that. There you go. All right. Linda, at this point, is the only one that could win a free lunch. There are free lunches here at the East Metro Tea Party. Linda, this is such a distinct honor. You are the first contestant of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Before Taxes. All right. You ready? We're going to start you on the $1,000 mark. Nervous? Remember, you got three options. If you're not confident, you can use one of those three options, right? First question is, what symbol represents the Democrat Party? Is it A, an elephant? Hold on. B, an eagle? C, a rat? Or D, a jackass? <laughs> Linda, do you know the answer? Definitely D, a jackass. D, a jackass. She is moving on to the next level. That's how the game's played. The first one's pretty easy. All right. They get trickier. I'm not joking. You better have been paying attention. All right. Linda, what year was the 16th Amendment to the Constitution ratified? Was it A, 1942, B, 1886, C, 1913, or D, 1787? That was 1913, C. Final answer? 
final answer. Was that you, Swede? Who, who's, who's the dancer? All right, all right, all right. It is C. You move on to the next level. All right. All right, Linda. If you get this right, your $5 gift card to Caribou Coffee is safe. Then we add another $5 Caribou Coffee. Awesome. Uh, okay. But you got to get it right. Here we go. Linda, the term used to describe the tax rate that applies to a particular income tax bracket. Is it A, marginal tax rate, B, a flat tax, C, an average tax rate, or D, effective tax rate? A, marginal. Are you sure about, you said, what would you say? A, marginal. Are you sure, are you sure about that? Yeah. You really don't need any participation from the audience yet. Well, I could be wrong, but I'm saying A, Mark. A, A final answer. She is correct. All right. There we go. <laughs> Linda, here's your $5 gift card. Put that in your pocket. That is safe. This one here now, you can win, right? Okay. Actually, you've actually won this already. I forgot how the game works. You've won this card already. Oh. But I can take it away from you if you don't get the next three right. But if you get the next three right, we're going to add a free lunch. Oh. <laughs> All right, here we go. In, what, in which year was the Magna Carta signed? Was it A, 1774, B, 1662, C, 1682, or D, 1215? Be quiet, audience. Be quiet. <laughs> And remember, on the top right, you've got, you've got some options there. Yeah, I do. I should know this. <laughs> I really should. Give me that 50-50. You, she wants a 50-50. All right, we're going to eliminate two options here. You ready for it? We're going to eliminate A, 1774, yeah. and C, 1682. Right, so it's either B or D. <laughs> B. <laughs> You're not really certain. You got two other lifelines, Linda. You can use them at this point if you need to. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Audience. She's such a crowd pleaser. <laughs> do you have Benner's uh, do you have Benner's phone number? <laughs> no. Okay, well, we, we're not going to change it. You actually have to literally call. I guess you could borrow my phone and be smart. What do you want? Call a friend. I guess I'll let you shout to Benner, or you can, uh, or you can ask the audience. What would you like to do? Audience. Okay, audience, what is the answer? D. 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 Linda, I think you're the only one in the room not paying attention to uh, Benner's portion. <laughs> what is the answer? 1215D. 1215D is correct. <laughs> really put you. Yeah. I just wanted to give them to do. Oh, exactly. She's always singing about other people, right? All right. Now we're at the $500,000 mark. Are you guys having a good time yet? This is what makes East Metro so cool. Although my college students didn't come back this week. I don't get it. Okay. In which Federalist paper did Alexander Hamilton argue? that Bill of Rights are reservation rights not surrendered to the prince. I'll repeat that. In which Federalist paper did Alexander Hamilton argue that Bills of Rights are res reservations of rights not surrendered to the prince? Is it A, Federalist 45, B, Federalist 84, C, Federalist 9, or D, Federalist 32? You've only got one lifeline left, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to need it, aren't I? <laughs> That means you got to call a friend. <laughs> you you want to call Benner? Yeah, I'm calling. Him. <laughs> well, okay, I'm going to be real nice, and I am going to let you. Here, give her a phone. I'm going to let you call. I obviously have Benner's number. <laughs> just so just so people don't think there's are any shenanigans here, you call him Benner, and you can see by the tattoos that's him. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Let's do this on speakerphone. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, brought to you by at and yeah, It is. Okay, here we go. Later, I'm kind of busy. <laughs> ask, ask Benner you're your not, question here on the speaker. You're not too busy. Ask him your question. <laughs> In which Federalist paper did Alexander Hamilton argue that bill of, bills of rights are reservations of rights, not surrendered to the prince? Help. I believe... 
I believe the answer is B, Federalist 84, and he wrote that under the pseudonym of Publius, which was a famous uh, Roman politician which helped end the monarchy in Rome and establish a republic in 509 BC. I knew that. <laughs> All right, Linda. <laughs> Linda, you heard an answer from Ben. Are you going to go with that answer? What What is the answer? <laughs> I think he said B. B, B Federal 84 is correct. <laughs> okay. What do they call it? TMI? Too much info? Okay. The $1 million question. Are you ready for this? You can see how hard they're getting, right? You have no lifeline left. You have no lifeline. All right. Are you ready for this? You do have a $5 gift card to Caribou Coffee. Oh yeah, I guess she could walk away. She, I, you know what, you could walk away right now with the, Caribou, the two Caribou gift cards. I love this audience. All right, here we go, $1 million question. She wants, well actually she does actually get to hear the question and then decide if she wants to walk away. I just watched an episode before coming over here. Good thing I did that. All right, here we go, Linda. Question, according to 2010 IRS figures, which is last year this was available, Individual filers with an adjusted gross income of over $500,000, which really only makes up 0.6% of all returns, paid what portion of the total federal income tax? Was it A, 78%, B, 47%, C, 26%, or is it D, 90%? You listen to Rush Limbaugh at all? Sure about that. 0.6%. 0.6%. We're talking about under 1% of tax filers pay how much of the federal income taxes? Either A or D. Either A or D. I'm. Hmm. <laughs> you know, Linda, you could walk away right now nope. with two Caribou Coffee gift nope. cards. Nope. Otherwise, you only have one. That's okay. okay. I just have to decide which one it is. A or D. D. 90%. She's going with D, 90%. Perhaps that's right. That's your final answer? That is my final answer. All right. That, you're locked in on that answer. Anyone have a different answer? A. A. C. P. I think this is going to shock a lot of people. I had to do some data digging. It's actually B, 47%. Roughly 1% in the top 1% pay about 50% of the tax bill. I thought it was more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's crazy. 1%. 0.6% almost pay a half of all the t federal income taxes. That's all right. I'm, I'm still going to give you a caribou gift card here because of my good graces, but you don't get the free lunch. Thanks for participating, Linda. Everyone give her a round of applause. If, if Jay Duesenberg Financial had the ability to give her the million dollar prize tonight, if, <laughs> she would have won a million dollars, but you know what, that, that darn it, IRS, she wouldn't have brought home a million dollars, she would have, well, she would have paid $343,646, the federal income tax via the IRS, and she would have paid the Minnesota uh, Revenue Service uh, 91769 which is a little bit more than she would have paid beforehand, thanks to Governor Dayton, and raising the top marginal tax rate to 9.85%. So Linda, you really would have only came away with $564,000, so those Caribou Coffee gift cards were plenty fine, right? <laughs> right. All right. I brought. I did that because we want to drive home a point that income taxes are a bad thing. You know, I I, I personally believe in uh, a system where the federal income or the federal government can only tax states. They can't actually tax uh, tax individuals. I would probably compromise. You know, the big important word with a fair tax, meaning that there's only a national consumption tax. But I just generally don't like the federal uh, federal government finding out how much even a private business makes. So, but we could at least all agree in this room, I hope, that a f uh, income tax is both an infringement on your right to privacy, where you, you know, don't have to share what your bank accounts and what your income is, and it's also a right to, uh, taking away your right to property. And I always look at it this way. We abolished slavery many years ago, right? 
because uh, it, it, I mean, slavery is a horrible thing. Essentially, what you're doing is you're giving up your labor involuntarily. But if you need to feed your family and provide your, your family uh, uh, some kind of sustenance, you need to go out and earn an income, right? And to earn an income, generally speaking, people have to provide their labor. So if government owns the income and they decide how much you get to keep, in essence, don't they own your labor? So that's one reason I'm very much opposed to it and also the invasion of privacy. But it's a totally different thing when you start an organization. And uh, I think everyone in here is well aware of what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now with the targeting by IRS officials, as the Obama administration says, it was just one rogue agency over in Cincinnati. I don't think anyone's buying that. Targeting groups that are either conservative, more importantly, have the name Tea Party in their 501c tax-exempt packet. So. Without further ado, I would like to invite a patriot up to the stage from Rochester, Minnesota. Cindy Maves is an uh, activist down there in Rochester, and she's got the experience she had when trying to file with the IRS 501c3 status. Um, thanks, everybody. Oh, by the way, this picture's in no way an endorsement of anything. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we got that straight. <laughs> um, I, I want to thank Jake for inviting me here tonight, and it's just great to see this many people here for just being your third meeting. This is a fantastic crowd. Um, we started our tea party back in 2009. We started at the original um, tax day rally on April 15th, 2009. Um, at that time, we had no idea what we were doing. We just wanted to have a tea party because we were having these tea parties across the country and we wanted to be a part of that. And when we had our tea party, we handed out, just like you guys did tonight, a list, a sign-up list for everybody to put their information down. And, and I can remember, we didn't even know what to even ask for on the information. And I can remember going home that night from that meeting and having this list. I mean, we ended up with 1,000 people at our tea party rally. And yeah, we had no idea if it would be 50 people, what it would be. We ended up with 1,000 people. And we went home with a list of about 500 people that we got to sign up. And we had no idea what to do with that list. Because back then, starting a tea party group wasn't even thought about yet. We just had this list and this incredible sense of, we have to keep this going. And now everybody's counting on us to keep this going. And so we started our group and we started figuring out what we were going to do and how we were going to meet and we had a few flop meetings and we got a group together and started a board and then we met regularly as a board to kind of direct how we're going and like Jake said, they're going to need a lot of people and a lot of help because you need communications people and you need people to do your literature for you and just there's a lot of little jobs that everybody can help out with but so we decided okay we want to do this right luckily we had some people on our board that were very organized and so we decided to file the right papers with the government we had many meetings debating over this how we were going to do this what do you do luckily my husband's an accountant and so he helped us through the process. So we decided at the beginning we were going to be a 501c3. So we, we got the paperwork together. Now the 501c3 was the one where you can't do any political stuff. It's all education. And we were going to be just an education group. So we filed our paperwork that fall of 2009 with the IRS. We after we filed the paperwork, we waited. Now, my husband's an accountant, and he said, this is going to take some time, be patient. So we just kind of waited and waited, and nothing happened, and nothing happened. And so about June of 2010, we called them up and said, well, what is the status of our 501c3? You know, by, by now, my husband had filed several other 501c3s that had come back and been approved. So they said, well, we never got your application. Now, you cannot 
email your application, you cannot fax your application, you have to physically put it in an envelope and mail it to them. Now we had a copy of our, our application, but we had no proof that we put it in an envelope and mailed it. There's no way to prove that. So we had to refile. This time we sent it registered mail so that we got a receipt to make sure that the IRS got it. So that was 2010. Uh, we waited again, but this time we were a little more on the ball and we started calling. And we called and they wouldn't return our phone calls. We got kind of put down the line and we ended up with a guy, you may have heard his name today. I heard some of the people testifying today say his name, Ron Ball. And he was the one doing all the applications, we were told. All the Tea Party applications. So when Mr. Ball would not return our phone calls, we filed a 911 form, which is a request for taxpayer advocate service assistance. Luckily, my husband knew how to do all that. So once that was filed, the next day, well, who should call him back but Ron Ball? <laughs> um, we got the same story. We're working on it. Uh, there are people above us that need to look at it. And it'll be another month. And so he continuously called every month because we had monthly board meetings and we would always say, hey, what's our status? <laughs> and so he had to keep on it. They, um, we didn't hear back, and he kept saying, it's going to be another month, it's going to be another month, it's going to be another month. Well, by now, we knew what was going on, and everybody knew what was going on, and we just figured we probably were never going to get this. So we started to get more politically involved, doing issues, not necessarily endorsing anybody, but getting involved in issues and having legislative updates. Then on February 19th, 2012, so this is two years later, well actually three years later, later from the original application, we were contacted by a letter, no, first by a phone call from, no, by a letter, sorry, the letter that we're circulating around. And um, we got this letter from the IRS with all of the questions. And you guys have the letter, you can kind of go through and you've heard on the news and stuff what these questions are and stuff. You're going to see a little part on there that's kind of blacked out. That was the name of an organization that we actually just kind of use their application. And at one point when we were copying and pasting, it didn't get erased out of there. So they were asking about that organization and we just don't want to bring them into it because they have nothing to do with their group whatsoever. But the rest of it are all the questions that they asked. Well, we also belong to the National Tea Party Patriots, which the coordinators belong on a phone call once a week. And so when we were on the, the phone call that week, we found out everybody else had been getting these letters. And so we decided as our organization to just wait it out. Now, if you, you see on the application, we got it on the 19th of February. They wanted it back on March 13th. We had 22 days to come up with all that information. All of our Facebook postings from our inception. Everything was from our inception. All of our Twitters, speeches people gave. They wanted our list. We had people starting to call us and say, well, you're not going give to give our donor list out, are you? You're not giving our names out to the IRS. Absolutely not. So luckily, again, we had an accountant. And he said, well, we'll just call him up and ask for an extension. So that's what we did. We just said, well, we just can't get this paperwork together that fast. We'd like an extension. That way we could just kind of, we knew that Tea Party Patriots was going to be contacting congressmen and senators on this. So we thought, well, we're just going to wait this out. So that's what we did. We filed for our extension. And then you kind of heard that the congressmen were writing letters and asking questions. And then in June of that year, this was from February when we got the letter, to June, we got a call that says, well, we've looked at your Facebook page and your website, and we don't think that you qualify to be a 501c3, but we do think you could qualify to be a 501c4. And if you just simply fill out the basic simple paperwork, we will get that right out to you. Well, at that point, we, we had gotten a little more politically involved, and we were pretty happy to get the 501c4, so that's what we did. We filled out the application for the 501c4, 
and we sent it in, and by September, we had our approval. And we never had to give all the information, and we never would have given them all of that information. And we, in fact, at that time, talked about other avenues that we could take. So that's pretty much our story. Um, there's over 500 groups now that they've determined have been targeted and harassed by the IRS. 25 groups have already filed an, a lawsuit against the IRS. Uh, we are pursuing doing that with the organization that's filing those 25. We're right now waiting to hear if they're going to accept us. They're going to take another, I think, 15 tea parties to add to this lawsuit, and we're hoping to get in on that. There is also a class action suit that's going to be filed, and so we have that avenue to go with, too. Um, it's very important here in Minnesota that we keep talking about this, because our own Senator Franken was one of the senators who signed, who signed a letter asking for groups to be investigated. Now, the letter doesn't specifically say Tea Party groups or conservative groups, but it definitely talks about all the 501c4 applications that are coming through and that they really wanted them to scrutinize them. So it's, it's very important in Minnesota that we keep this issue alive and that he's held accountable for this. Whether it can be proven or not that President Obama was directly involved, we'll, we'll never know, I don't think. But we do know that he created this culture. He called us terrorists. He stood in, at the podium and said, oh, those people wagging tea bags around. He created this culture that's going on in Washington. If your boss is talking about people in the way that he talks about us, it just creates that atmosphere that the employees think that they're supposed to do that. We want to thank uh, Chairman Daryl Issa, Chairman Dave Camp, and Chairman Andrew Cren Ander Crenshaw for calling hearings and doing investigations on this. If it wasn't for them, oh sorry, I ruined your computer. If it wasn't for them, you know, it's important that they keep this going. So if you get a chance and you can and send emails out to some of these chairmen or members of these committees and thank them, it's always good to do the positive instead of the negative. So always try to send thank yous to representatives and Congress and senators when they do something to help your tea parties. Um, the First Amendment guarantees us freedom of speech, and the Supreme Court has consistently said that that includes the right of association. Americans have the right to form groups and associations for the purpose of political education and civic engagement. One of the Rochester Tea Party Patriot core beliefs is that our government should be constitutionally limited. The IRS scandal illustrates just how important our mission is and how important it is that we keep growing and making our government accountable. Uh, Cindy would take questions if anyone's, yeah, I knew there'd be questions here. <laughs> There's, it's such an interesting topic. Okay, go ahead. Um, I have a, yeah, I'm sure you can find it. I don't have the website. I think I have a copy of it with me tonight, though. Yes. We probably went down to 400 and some, or maybe even around 300 and some, um, you know, from our original 500 names that we gathered. And we're now back up to 788 names. Um, I can't, thanks. I can't say they're all members, because we do have the, the Rochester Post Bulletin and KTTC and many of those organizations that, you know, get our newsletter. What do you mean the turnout? The turnout. Uh, At our parties or for the... 
It's just hard. Yeah. Right. It it really kept. I, we really feel like it kept our donations down, because we originally came out and said, well, we're filing for the 501c3. Your donations are going to be tax deductible. Well, then we had to start telling people, well, we don't know if we're going to get it. So now you're ta now it's not deductible. And, you know, it really made us look like we were in this limbo and the IRS is investigating us. And so people really backed off. They, you know, we got cash donations, but we really didn't get a lot of checks and stuff because nobody wanted their name out there for the IRS. But don't you remember between the 10 and the 12 election, how uh, the Tea Party in 12 as compared to 10 was the landslide of the conservative Tea Party? How much did that affect those congressional Oh, definitely. They were definitely. Yeah. I think what happened was, yeah, you would have seen a bigger expansion of the Tea Party during that time. But because of this, they didn't. In fact, you know, we're, we're the only Tea Party that I know of in Minnesota that's having this issue, but not because we're the only Tea Party. We actually were talking to the other Tea Parties in the state at that time. In fact, we were kind of meeting on a regular basis of the Tea Party leaders and different, we discussed what everybody was doing for their papers and everybody knew that we had filed this and so they were all waiting to see if we were gonna get ours. You know, why bother filing? Why go through the work until we see what happens to Rochester? Because they've already done it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. It did. It made a huge difference. She said that what happened with the, the 912 groups and the libertarian stuff affected what happened over time, too. What happened with the Tea Party, sure. Yes. Well, and if you read on there, too, it's perjury if you answer it wrong. And you're supposed to say if your people were planning to run for office, you were supposed to have all copies of the speeches that your speakers gave. It'd be like my speech here tonight. Well, you know, here you are three years later, and we'd like a copy of that speech or anything that was handed out or, yeah, there, there was no way we could come up with all that. Anything else? Yes. No, no. It was definitely, yeah, if you, if you get a copy of this, there's definitely specific questions to us in there. So they really did take the time and go through everybody's stuff and ask specific questions because um, did, I don't know if you saw the testimony today but there is a marriage organization pro marriage organization and they actually got a phone call that said you know do you promise not to protest any Planned Parenthood and and yeah so everybody got different yes What I've, what I've read about the union representing the agents there is that they met with President Obama the day before the targeting started. The, the head gal from that organization met with President Obama that day and according to the investigative general, he said that it started the very next day. She met like May 31st and it was June 1st and 2nd that the targeting had started. So, how you'll ever tie that in, I don't know. <laughs> yes? So, aside from the potential lawsuit in the IRS, what is the Rochester Tea Party? 
Harvey Patriots not accomplished yet. What have we so got? How do you feel like you've accomplished since you've established your party? Hmm. Excellent question. Um, we've actually done a lot of local stuff. We, we um, after our, our inception and we started doing the federal stuff, we kind of moved into more s local things. We had a sales tax issue come up, a city sales tax extension. Uh, we went up and testified before the, you know, the state and um, we got $20 million taken off of that city sales tax extension, which we thought was a huge accomplishment. Um, <laughs> They wanted, they wanted to build on our library and um, we got the library taken off and um, the Boys and Girls Club, which was both, well, the, the library didn't need to be extended, it was fairly new, and the Boys and Girls Club is a nonprofit and we didn't feel it was appropriate that we be funding a nonprofit. Uh, we've been fighting the Mayo Civic Center in Rochester. So far we've been successful on that point. We've, um, we got our county and our school board to both not raise taxes two years in a row. Our city, unfortunately, hasn't been near as cooperative, but we do organize groups to go, and when on the Truth and Taxation Days, we go in and we have people, you know, go up and speak, and, you know, we organize to do that, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll maybe give some presentations on it, a meeting or two before, so everybody kind of knows what the issues are and, you know, where the taxes are at, and, and we encourage people to contact, you know, when issues come up, we get people to contact their representatives on the issues and stuff. Um, gosh, that's such a big question. There's, and it just feels like there's so many things we did. We just, rally, we just had a rally down at the IRS office a couple weeks ago and did the picketing. That gets us on the news. That gets people knowing about us. Um, and we do a lot of education. We bring in a lot of speakers. Um, we've done education. You know, on the IRS, we've done education on the debt, the national debt. We've done education on, um, uh, I'm on the spot and I can't think, Obamacare, a lot of things like that that we... We had Bill Whittle. Oh, yeah, we had Bill Whittle come down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I was contacted, and I, I used to be the chair of the Tea Party, and I've now moved that, someone else has taken that over, I'm still on the board, but I was still, I'm kind of the spokesman for the group, and because this IRS stuff all happened under my watch, I, I was the one that took the calls for this and stuff. Um, what happened was, I, my first call, I think, was from NPR. And I think Michelle Bachman probably facilitated some of that. And so then what I did was, which is a really great way to do this, then you go on Twitter and you say, oh, isn't it interesting that NPR wants to know about this, but our local media is not covering it. <laughs> oh, they don't like that. You know, and you use your hashtag of your, of your city so that everybody in your city sees that. Oh, I, and, and I drive a school bus for a living, so I'm out in my school bus, can't answer my phone, and my cell phone is ringing off the hook. But we did talk to then a uh, local TV station, local new, uh, newspaper. We did WCCO, the Trib interviewed us, you know. Uh, Mankato did an, did an interview on it, but Twitter is very effective for that kind of thing. They do not like to have it drawn to their attention that they're not covering something. And I do that quite often. I'll put the, the Twitter, you know, Rochester, Minnesota hashtag, and then I'll just say, I wonder why the press isn't covering this, or did, I wonder why the Post Bulletin doesn't do, you know, a story about this, or I wonder if they know about this. And um, they, the minute you have a story, they start covering you. I mean, all of a sudden, everybody wants to follow you to see what you know. And so social media is great for that. You don't have to call them up and say, why aren't you covering this? You just put it out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that is a very good question, and thanks for bringing that up. Um, Senator Sinjum is an 
well loved by our Republican Party in town, which is a very interesting dynamic because, yeah, then we have the Tea Party and the Republican Party. Um, we have contacted him many times. And in fact, um, it was probably one of the first calls I ever made to a senator was, well, four years ago, three years ago, when he voted for a bonding bill. And there was only like five, it had to be before the Republicans took office, and there was only like four or five that voted for it, and I called him. I, I think I sent him an email, and I said, you know, what kind of Republican are you? And he actually called me back on the phone, and I was like, oh my God, my senator called me back, you know? But it, we're on him all the time, <laughs> trust me. But um, he is very Mayo Clinic oriented. Whatever in Rochester, we have a real problem with whatever Mayo Clinic wants, the, our, our representatives back. And because Mayo Clinic DMC was in that tax bill, he voted for it. I was amazed Senator Carla Nelson did not vote for it. Anything else? Okay, well, thanks so much for having me tonight. Thank you. That was awesome. Thanks so much, Cindy. Wow. Okay. Another thing that, oh, I jumped ahead of the slide here. Go ahead and hit that banner. show you is that there's a thousand years of history in liberty that fortifies the foundation for our documents, for our Constitution, for our Bill of Rights, the same, very same liberty that people for a thousand years bled and died for. How many of you, before you got in this movement, watched what was going on in this country and thought, it just doesn't feel right. There's just something wrong about what's going on. Maybe I can't put my finger on it. Maybe I don't know exactly what that means. There's just something wrong. The greatest opponents to the federal government admit the state legislatures to be the sure guardians of people's liberty. How many of our state legislators understand their primary goal is to protect us from federal government reaching into the state rights and not a primary goal to create laws for our state? If you think that the kids aren't listening to what's going on, you're sadly mistaken. The reason church and state, that phrase, can be abused and misused is because we don't know the history behind it. The purpose of the people to bear arms, as stated by Richard Henry Lee, as stated in the Bill of Rights of 1689, is to protect liberty. We are seeing time and time again how interrelated these things are. There is not one single right in our Bill of Rights more important than the other, but they all if we were educated as to the purpose of the Ninth Amendment, we would be able to be outraged when the courts began to argue whether we had rights or not. Liberty is a gift from God. Who can take away from you something that God has given you? No one. No one can take a gift from you that God has given you. But you can give it away. So I challenge you. Pick up that torch. Reacquaint yourselves with the value of liberty. Chris Ann Hall. Wow. This is going to be her third time to Minnesota. This is a Floridian that worked for 
the state of Florida as an attorney. She chose to start teaching when called by some groups the Constitution. She didn't charge anybody. She studied and she taught. The state of Florida found that offensive. And so, here's a young lady. Her husband is a Baptist minister. And if you know anything about the ministry, they're not bringing home six-figure incomes. They're serving people. She has a nice income. And they walk up to her and say, you quit what you're doing or you don't have a job. She took a deep breath. And she says, that's a choice you're going to make. Because what I do on my time, with my core beliefs, I shall continue to do. So they discharged her. That's the line in the sand that a lot of us sitting in this room are going to be faced with sooner than you can, can imagine. Well, her third trip here is because we keep getting requests for her to come. I went to work with her uh, scheduling volunteer, Janet, who is a sweetheart of a lady. And I said, can you contact a few more people in Minnesota? Here's a list of people I think that might you know, want to have the opportunity to hear in person that may not be able to get to the Twin Cities. She scheduled at your tea party down in Rochester. She scheduled at Browerville. She scheduled in St. Cloud. And she scheduled on the radio when she gets off the plane. Jake and I will be on the radio with her on AM 1130 uh, with late debate. She's tireless. You saw that. You saw the tip of the iceberg there. If you have not been in her seminar, there isn't enough money at any college in this United States to buy what you're going to get in four and a half hours on Saturday. If you've been there before and you're at my age, go again because you forgot two-thirds of what she taught. <laughs> but don't miss it. This is a person who has committed her life to it. You're seeing an opportunity here, and I want you to see it differently quick. Saturday is only a few days away. We have been able to raise enough money so nobody has to pay for it. How about the kid who mows your grass? How about one of the people on one of the committees in your church? How about a dear friend? Every day I'm asked this question. My family all drank the Kool-Aid and I got that question tonight. There may not be a way to bring them there, but there is a way for you to gain the knowledge so when they do have a question, you can answer it from your heart, not in, a, in an abrasive contact way, but in the right way. All I can say, if you haven't met Chris Ann Hall, if you don't have any of her books, if you don't have her DVDs, make Saturday a priority. You are going to be blown away. This young lady is incredible. All right, starts at 9 o'clock at the Mermaid. But I want to say one last thing here. If your actions inspires others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you have learned how to serve. That's what she does. That's what Cindy does. That's what your toolkit will do, too. Jake, back to you. Thank you, Jack. Okay, uh, like Jack said, uh, the event is free, so, and the reason we want to do that is because high schoolers and college students can attend and make sure they get this important lesson. 
at lunch hour, we are going to break for an hour, and uh, we have a wonderful opportunity to meet the gubernatorial candidates. Scott Honor and Jeff Johnson have made themselves available. If you haven't met one of those two individuals, you're going to get a chance. Now, the, the Tea Party PAC doesn't, doesn't endorse candidates, okay? And so don't construe this as an endorsement. It's a chance for you guys to go talk to these people and vet them as candidates. That's what we need to do as Tea Party. Make sure that they believe in free markets, fiscal responsibility, individual, individual liberty. What do you want, Joey? That's a question you can ask, ask him at, on Saturday. That's right, but you gotta show up on Saturday. <laughs> we also, I have no idea what Tom Emmer is gonna say on Wednesday in D Delano at 5.30. I have no idea. So we'll have, to, we'll have to hear him out. But Tom Emmer has graciously made his time available during that same hour at the Mermaid, which is the event that's hosting Chris Ann Hall. The uh, wonderful people at Mermaid have put together a Italian-style menu uh, for $14, and it's actually pretty similar. You know, it's funny. I, I, I said they, they had it jacked up to like $17 or something like that. I'm like, that's too much. So I sent them what the machine shed uh, charges, and they came back and uh, made it more competitive. So God bless competition, right? If you stick around, though. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. Yep. If I have no idea what Tom is going to announce tomorrow at Delano, in uh, well, I what is that? Is it it's a park or something like that in Delano? I haven't been out to Delano. I don't know. Could it be that? Is that big? Main Street, somewhere in Main Street. Okay, there is. I I've heard of a draft Emmer Facebook account or something like that. You might want to check that out. <laughs> There's also a Facebook page for uh, Emmer's big announcement. Okay, if you stick around though, after the Chris Ann Hall event, in the evening, we're doing a good old fashioned Minnesota finger licking good food barbecue. And uh, you can meet the legislators that were conservative warriors up there at the Capitol, or if they weren't, you can question those people. We've got David Fitzsimmons, Mary Franson, Peggy Scott, Tom Hackbarth attending, and, and Jack uh, Scott Nino, Senator Scott Nino is gonna attend as well, he said? Okay, so $25, you can go to teaparty.mn, you can reserve online a spot uh, for, uh, to, to attend that. That's in the tent. They usually use that for uh, wedding ceremony or wedding res receptions, but somehow it was available. Uh, so that's Saturday night at 6.30. So there's a jam-packed full fun day. Learn the Constitution, meet and greet with the gubernatorial candidates and Tom Emmer who might be a candidate, and, uh, <laughs> and then also in the evening you can um, do a meet and greet with legislators. Any questions on those events? Okay. This is what's unique about the East Metro Tea Party, is we do something called What's Hot on YouTube. Young kids like myself, right, uh, we watch YouTube religiously. In fact, that's how I get the majority of my news. I kind of filter out the crap and only watch the stuff that I know I want to watch. Um, many of you in here might not have that opportunity to watch it or might not know what YouTube is, Bob Tatro. So what we do is we show you the most important things on YouTube, <laughs> the most trending stories, the things that uh, we believe you should watch. So um, let's start out here with, oh, here's tonight's list. We have Lois Lesnar's testimony. If you haven't seen this, it's the House Oversight Committee. They attempt to question the IRS official and she invokes the Fifth Amendment, which is actually a constitutional constitutionally protected right. However, when you're a federal agent, that's some sketchy business. Uh, Representative Gowdy questions the former IRS Shulman, uh, Chief Shulman. Uh, this is a pretty good segment. And then, is anyone in here a fan of Ted Cruz? I mean, oh my God. Wait till you watch this eloquently bring up the four big, or the three or four, I'm losing track, three or four big scandals of the White House right now that are currently plaguing Washington, D.C. And then I squeezed in one at the end, uh, uh, a young freshman congressman out in Oklahoma, and I don't have that on here, but you'll see it when we get to it. So I think it's about 20 minutes of video here, so if uh, you guys need to get up and about to use the bathroom or, or whatnot, feel free to do that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Lerner, uh, earlier uh, the ranking member made me aware of a response we have uh, that is purported to come from you 
in regards to questions that the IG asked during his investigation. Uh, can we have you authenticate the, simply the questions and answers previously given to the Inspector General? I, I don't know what that is. I'd have to look at it. Okay. Would you please make, uh, make it available to the witness? This appears to be my response. So it's your t testimony that, as far as your recollection, that is your response? That's correct. Ms. Lerner, the topic of today's hearing is the IRS improper targeting of certain groups for additional scrutiny regarding their application for tax-exempt status. As director of exempt organizations of the Tax-Exempt and Government Entities Division of the IRS, you are uniquely positioned to provide testimony to help this committee better understand how and why the IRS targeted these groups. To that end, I must ask you to reconsider, particularly in light of the fact that you have given not once but twice testimony before this committee under oath this morning. You have made an opening statement in which you made assertions of your innocence, assertions you did nothing wrong, assertions you broke no laws or rules. Additionally, you have authenticated earlier answers to the IG. At this point, uh, I believe you have not asserted your rights, but in fact have effectively waived your rights. Would you please seek counsel for further guidance at the, on this matter while we wait? I will not answer any questions or testify about the subject matter of this committee's meeting. We will take your refusal as a refusal to testify. The witness and counsel are dismissed. Uh, the gentleman will state a point of order. Please wait. Mr. Issa, Mr. Cummings just said we should run this like a courtroom, and I agree with him. She just testified. She just waived her Fifth Amendment right to privilege. You don't get to tell your side of the story and then not be subjected to cross-examination. That's not the way it works. She waived her right to Fifth Amendment privilege by, by issuing an opening statement. She ought to stand here and answer our questions. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cummings. I, I, first of all, with all respect for my good friend, Mr. Gowdy, I said I'd like to see it run like a federal court. Unfortunately, this is not a federal court. And she does have a right, and I think, and, and we have to uh, adhere to that. Thank you. We'll pause for a moment. Ms. Lerner, I'll ask you just a couple of additional questions. Is it possible that we could narrow the scope of questions and that there are some areas that you would be able to answer any questions on here today? I will not answer any questions or testify today. Ms. Lerner, would you uh, be willing to answer questions specifically related to the earlier statements made under oath before this committee? I decline to answer that question for the reasons I've already given. 
For this reason, I have no choice but to excuse the witness subject to recall after we seek specific counsel on the questions of whether or not the constitutional right of the Fifth Amendment has been properly waived. Notwithstanding that, in consultation with the Department of Justice as to whether or not limited or use immunity could be negotiated, the witness and counsel are dismissed. Uh, the clerk will please rearrange the seating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shulman, when you learned that conservative groups were being targeted by the IRS for discriminatory treatment, what did you do? Um, when, when I learned uh, of the existence of a BOLO list, um, in that same conversation, or, or right around that time, um, uh, I also uh, learned a couple things. One, that it was being stopped, so that. All right. And who told you it was being stopped? That's um, Steve Miller, my deputy. All right. And did you investigate further? Did, can you give me the name of a single person who was involved in the original decision to target conservative groups for disparate treatment? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of those names. Why can't you give me a name? So at the same time uh, that I learned and that it was being stopped, I was um, also told that the Inspector General uh, was aware of it. Mr. Shulman, is the Inspector it. General the only person who can investigate wrongdoing within the IRS? Um, my uh, general practice... Can you answer my question and then, then you can explain. Is the Inspector uh, General the only entity who can investigate wrongdoing? Um, Congress can investigate. How about you? And can you do it? The, the practice at the Internal Revenue Service that uh, I inherited. So if the there's one that inappropriate I conduct being done on your watch in the IRS, then that inappropriate conduct can last as long as the Inspector General's investigation lasts. Is that what you're telling me? Um, that you're not going to step in and stop it? No, I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you If there's someone wielding a knife in the parking lot, are you going to call the Inspector General? Are you going to wait until his or her investigation is over before you stop it? When I was told about this, uh, these allegations, um, I was also told that uh, they were being stopped and so that the inappropriate criteria were not being used And despite anymore. the seriousness and potential criminality of that conduct, you didn't investigate it yourself at all? So the procedures that I inherited and that, uh, that my Mr. general Shulman, practice this is going to go winning. much quicker if you'll answer yes or no, and then you can explain. Did you do anything to verify that the practice, as insidious as it was, was stopped? Um, the uh, inspector general was going to be looking into it, and that's what Is it that you can't say yes or no, or you're just choosing not to say yes or no? Can you answer the question, did you do anything? personally to make sure that this insidious discriminatory practice was stopped um, yes or no at the time that i learned about it uh, i also learned two things the first was that it was being stopped and the second was that the and what did you do to verify that it was stopped the responsible deputy uh, of the internal revenue service told me it was being stopped. I had no reason to believe otherwise. Did you I, investigate why and, and conservative groups were being targeted? Excuse me? Did you investigate? So you can't give me a single name. You can't answer the who. Can you tell me the why? Why were conservative groups? Why was the culture such under your watch that an employee felt comfortable targeting conservative groups? Did you uh, investigate that? You know, from my reading of the report, um, I can't tell if it was political motivation or if it was tone deaf, somebody trying to expedite a way. You, you, you still don't know that this was political. Excuse me? You still don't know that this was political? I'd, I'd defer to the inspector general. Well, I'll tell you this, Mr. Shulman. Your predecessor said that he wasn't sure if it was partisan, and that requires the listener to be as stupid as the speaker, to utter a comment like that. He just testified that policy positions dictated this. What does that mean to you? If it's not partisan, what does that mean? 
I'm not sure I heard that testimony. Well, we'll be sure and get you a copy of the transcript, and you can supplement your testimony. How's that? I'd, Do you agree with Dan Pfeiffer? Committee's questions. Do you agree with Dan Pfeiffer that the law is irrelevant, or do you think it is relevant? I think the law is always relevant. Do you think 26 U.S.C. 7214, which provides for criminal penalties for this conduct, would be relevant? And did you refer the matter to someone with law enforcement investigative jurisdiction? Um, a, I'm not going to speculate what's appropriate legally in this matter. And um, Mr. George, I knew his operation was looking at it, I believe. I thought it was an audit. I thought he just testified it was an audit, not an investigation. Did you refer it for criminal investigation? Um, I didn't refer it. It was already being looked into at the time that it was brought uh, to my attention. So I, I want to be real clear because my time is out. The only recourse you have when there's an allegation of wrongful conduct on your watch, the only thing you feel comfortable doing is waiting on an inspector general to finish his or her report. The, the general practice is to make sure the inspector general will look into it. No matter how insidious the conduct. If it were an allegation of racial discrimination, you would have waited until Mr. George finished his investigation? Is that your testimony? I'm, I'm really not going to answer hypotheticals. I, I tell you what, instead of answering a hypothetical, why don't you answer the case at bar today? If there's an allegation that groups are being discriminated against based on political ideology, are you really going to wait until an inspector general finishes his or her report before you take corrective remedial action? When I have a fact, but I don't have all the facts, and I don't know the scope and severity. Did you investigate the, the facts, way. Mr. Shulman? Did you lift a finger to identify the facts? I felt very comfortable. The facts, um, the Inspector General was going to run down the facts, and once he had it, it would uh, be reported out. Let the record reflect that's a no. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I, under, I, I know you guys have been there a long time. We appreciate your patience. We're Developing right now, a congressional investigation is underway into whether Attorney General Eric Holder lied, lied under oath to Congress. Lawmakers now trying to clarify the Attorney General's testimony about his knowledge and involvement in the potential criminal prosecution of journalists. Joining me now, Texas Republican Senator Ted Cruz, who is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator, great to see you here. Megan, it's always good to be with you. How much trouble do you think Eric Holder's in right now? Well, I, I think that... Uh... The conduct of the Justice Department does not inspire confidence. Uh, we have seen pattern after pattern with respect to, to, to uh, investigation of the media. We've seen the Department of Justice willing to seize the phone records, to seize the emails of, of this network, uh, of the Associated Press. And by all appearances, the Attorney General went before Congress, stated he had nothing to do with it, and now it's become public that he did, in fact, have, have quite, a great, quite a bit to do with it. I think the Attorney General needs to come forward and explain what the truth is uh, and why he told Congress something different. Now, our viewers should know you went to Harvard Law School. You clerked for Chief Justice William Rehnquist, then Chief Justice William Rehnquist. You were the Solicitor General uh, down in Texas, meaning the top appellate uh, arguer. Uh, and then you worked for the Department of Justice under President Bush. You were the Deputy Attorney General. So you know a thing or two about being Attorney General and about the law. How unusual is it in your experience for the DOJ to be going after reporters, their records, and so on? I mean, is this to you something that would likely stand out in Eric Holder's mind? Oh, it's unprecedented. Uh, and, and the degree of willingness of this administration to target, to target a reporter for this network as an unindicted co-conspirator, uh, I mean, that, that is without precedent. And, and unfortunately, I think it's part and parcel of a pattern from this administration of not respecting the Bill of Rights, not respecting the First Amendment, not respecting the Second Amendment, not respecting our Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights regarding drone strikes, regarding the IRS. Over and over again, the pattern we've seen is an unfortunate willingness to use the machinery of the federal government uh, as a tool uh, to and a partisan tool to punish those perceived as your political enemies. And I, I think that's really troubling, particularly when combined with a willingness uh, to dissemble and, and to mislead the American people. Do you think this comes from the top? Well, it, it certainly, we have seen 
uh, the lack of candor from the Attorney General, and there's been a pattern at the Department of Justice of disregarding the law. And, and let me say, as, as someone who served in the Department of Justice, who respects, you know, the Department of Justice is an institution that reveres the law and, and that has a solemn obligation to follow the law. And when you have the U.S. Department of Justice disregarding the law, uh, multiple times that that raises serious concern. Do you think President Obama should ask for Eric Holder's resignation? Yes, a absolutely. I, and, and I think the reason is this Department of Justice has demonstrated a willingness to disregard the law. Look, if you, if you go back to the Fast and Furious scandal, where the U.S. Department of Justice was responsible for selling guns to Mexican drug cartels, those guns were used to murder hundreds of Ill innocent civilians and at least two federal law enforcement officers. Now, Megan, if you or I, you practiced law a, a long time, if you or I sold guns to a, a, a drug cartel, we'd be thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. And yet in that case, uh, they, they basically fired nobody. Ultimately, mm -hmm. a couple of people resigned. And the, the desk chairs right. were shuffled. Right. And we just talked about how in um, the State Department, in the wake of Benghazi, you have four people on paid administrative leave. No one gets fired. Mm -hmm. uh, so far at the IRS, they've asked for the resignation of one guy who was about to leave anyway. Right. And then th there was another guy. But the people who are actually doing it, everybody's still in place. Lowest learner, paid administrative yep. leave. Yep. Well, I know it's hard to fire a bureaucrat, mm -hmm. but it can be done, can it not? It certainly can, but there's got to be accountability. I think President Obama needs to take responsibility and needs to tell the truth. You know, in recent weeks, there are at least two instances of senior officials for the administration telling flat-out falsehoods. Number one, the White House press secretary said with regard to Benghazi that neither the White House nor the State Department had changed the talking points at all other than changing the word consulate. Now, within a few days, ABC News reported that that wasn't true, that they changed it a dozen times. They deleted al-Qaeda. They deleted references to terrorism. Now, that was simply an objectively false statement made on behalf of the President of the United States to the American people. Likewise, the IRS went before Congress and said they were not targeting groups based on political affiliation and at the time senior leadership of the IRS knew that wasn't true the deputy secretary of the treasury department a political appointee had been told that wasn't true yeah. and uh, you know that now trust is eroding uh, trust is eroding among the american people and i want to ask you about that because you made headlines recently by saying you do not trust the republicans or the democrats <laughs> on the subject of the debt and the debt ceiling and now your critics have come out and said Look at this guy. He's, he, he's a, quote, enemy of compromise. He j all he wants is all-out political war because he hates both parties. Your response? Look, I think we need to fix the problem. I, I think so many of the American people are frustrated, and they're frustrated with leaders in both parties. In the last four and a half years, our national debt's gone from $10 trillion to nearly $17 trillion. We're bankrupting the country. We're bankrupting our kids and grandkids. And, and I think the American people are frustrated with political bickering in Washington, with excuses. I think we need no excuses. Fix the problem. This issue arose because Harry Reid in the Senate is trying to use a procedural backdoor to raise the debt ceiling with using just 50 votes instead of 60, which would mean he could just keep digging the debt hole deeper, charge more and more trillions on the national credit card while doing nothing to fix the problem, to get our economy growing, to stop the structural spending problems. And I think we need to stop playing politics, roll up our sleeves and fix the problem. I think that's what, what voters expect. Of what do you make of the, the there's been such a backlash against you from some, in particular on the left. They call you a bomb thrower. They say you're too far right. Uh, they don't see you as the future of the Republican Party because they think you're too far to the right to win and win over moderates. Well, look, f folks are entitled to throw whatever the rocks they want, whatever insults they want. Um, I can tell you from my end, I have no intention of reciprocating. I, they, whatever insult they level my way, I will not respond in kind. What I'm going to stay focused on is trying to do the job the American people want and expect. And, and I'll tell you, I, you know, there are some Republicans that will beat their chest and say they're the most terribly conservative people on earth. Listen, I, I, I'm working to defend common sense conservative principles living within your means that's not a particularly right or left concept outside of washington dc that's basic common sense don't bankrupt the country don't bankrupt your household live within your means don't spend money we don't have don't put so many taxes and regulations on the economy that you kill small businesses and kill jobs that's got, common sense i got a heartbreak in 20 seconds you gonna run you gonna run for the next the next step sir 
100% of my focus is the U.S. Senate. Yeah, you can never get a straight answer on this question. <laughs> never. But I have to ask. Senator, it's great to see you. Mr. Speaker, the President's Justice Department sold weapons to narco-terrorists south of our border who killed one of our finest. The President's State Department lied about Benghazi with false information provided by the White House. The President's Attorney General authorized spying on a Fox News journalist and his family for reporting on a North Korean nuclear test. The President's Justice Department confiscated phone records of the Associated Press because they reported on a thwarted terrorist attack. The President's Treasury Department uses the IRS to target political opposition. The President's Health and Human Services Secretary pressures the insurance companies she is supposed to regulate um, to promote Obamacare, which is the same law she uses to force citizens to pay for abortion-inducing drugs against their religious liberties. Mr. Speaker, the President's dishonesty incompetence, vengefulness, and lack of moral compass lead many to suggest that he is not fit to lead. The only problem is that his vice president is equally unfit and even more embarrassing. He's an up-and-comer, isn't he? <laughs> All right. All right, whip out your smartphones or pen and paper here. This is for your calendar, June 10th, the Chris Ann Hall event, as we brought up before. That's at the Mermaid in North St. Paul. Uh, that's 2200 Highway 10, I believe, in Mounds View. You can tell when I've been putting out a lot of uh, stuff. Oh my God! I made a mistake. It's the it's June 8th, or was that a check on learning? <laughs> June 8th. I'm sorry, M Mounds View. And you know what? I didn't change that slide either, did I, Jack? Wow. All right, give me two screw ups tonight. If I make three, then I'm just as bad as the vice president. Jack, what day is what day is your next North Metro Tea Party? June 13th. June 13th. I am sorry, folks. June 13th, June 8th is a Chris Ann Hall event. July 2nd is our next East Metro Tea Party. We generally meet on Thursday. I was expecting a little less of a crowd tonight. This is fantastic how many people showed up. We had to make a switch in a, about a week and a half out, and that's kind of a no-no in politics. But we had to do it because they had this room booked prior to us knowing that we expanded this big to go into this room in the first place. And so I had to move it to Tuesday. I didn't mind so much because I can't ask you guys to come here on July 4th, which is the first Thursday of next month. So I'm going to ask you to come here on another Tuesday in July 2nd. And if you have comments about rather Tuesday or Thursday, I've got a comment box over there. Tell me what your thoughts are on this. Anything dealing with the East Metro Tea Party, we're, we're not angels up here. If we were, we wouldn't need government, right? If you have any comments on how to make the East Metro Tea Party better, please write and put in that uh, comments box. And then July 27th is Beer and Bullets. It's run by uh, Jack's GOP, and he always tells me to put this on here because I can't think of two things that go better together. I also got someone handed me uh, something about Bill's Gun Range and Hudson's Grand Opening. So they must have had a soft opening already because I know they're already doing business, but their grand opening that they're advertising is June 7th through 9th. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Well, it says machine gun rentals available. Ooh. That's all I'm going to say about it. If they want more of an advertisement, they've got to be a sponsor. Okay, once again, June 8th, this Saturday, Chris Ann Hall starts at... Oh, uh, registration starts at 9 a.m. You can go to teaparty.mn, register online. It gives us a good count of how many people are probably going to be attending lunch, and that's at the Mermaid there. Special thank you to the organizers, Dave Benner, Jack Rogers, Kirk Burback, Steve Allenwood with the uh, sound. Everyone give a round of applause. The East Metro Tea Party is not an organization as far as IRS or political committees are concerned. We're just basically a bunch of people that meet the party. 